Okay. Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 55, November 14th, 2006. We're visiting with former Grand Electric Cooperative Manager Leroy Shecker. Leroy, where and when were you born? Bison, South Dakota. Actually born out on the farm on uh, May the 26th, 1931. Okay. Is there a difference between saying born on the farm or born on the ranch up there? Well, this was a farm. Okay. Although we both, we had some of both, but it was predominantly a farm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was your father's name? William. William George. Okay. You want to what? You want to talk about him a little bit? What sort of a person was he? Well, he was. Uh, strangely enough, he was born in Cleveland, Texas. Hmm. His. Uh, what part of Texas is that? It's north east of Cle of uh, Houston, about thirty miles. And uh, he came to, uh, well, how his parents got down there is something of a mystery. Mm. But he was there for about four years. His father was managing some farms. And I was down and found the record about four, four or five years ago. And they were there. And Dad was the oldest one in the family. Uh, his uh, next oldest sister was born in 1899, and then they left Texas, and they ended up in Trent, South Dakota. That's the next known location, north of Sioux Falls. Yeah. Uh, they were there for about, uh, oh, probably three years, and then they went to Reliance, South Dakota, and they ended up in Perkins County in 1908. Okay. So. And my dad, uh, uh, of course, at that point, he was born in 1896. So he was uh, he was twelve years old, and uh, they brought his dad that was born here. Although they they brought a lot of the traditions from from Europe. For example, he built a stone barn and a stone house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming Checker is German, right? Right, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. The stone house is still lived in, and the stone barn was just tore down about oh probably five or six years ago. Uh, I got a picture of it in there, mm -hmm. and no mortar or anything. So Dad was—I uh, mean, he was—he worked. He—he uh, he started a farm uh, north or west of his parents' farm, about a mile. The farm's still there. Mm -hmm. That's where I was born and raised, and uh, it's still in the family. It belongs to my son today. His. My dad's grandson, of course, and uh, I suspect that it's going to stay there a while. It's good to hear. Um, what was your mother's name? Her name was Elnora, and uh, she was. Uh, Last name. Utterdahl was her maiden name, mm -hmm. and she was uh, born in Rivello, South Dakota. Her. Uh, Parents were, one was Norwegian and the other one was Swedish. And uh, they came to Perkins County about that, about that same time, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, yeah, her father died at a very young age of 39. Yeah. And he's buried in Revillo. And, sure, her mother uh, remarried and, and moved to Perkins County. And uh, she did the same thing. They worked the farm. That's that's what they did. They went through the dirty 30s, which I, even though I was uh, pretty young, I can remember mm -hmm. uh, having to sell the cattle and and uh, those kinds of things. I mean, going was tough. There was no wheat, no grain, and the ground was bare. I can remember following my dad around. The gr ground was bare enough, and he was always interested in artifacts, so he'd go out and hunt arrowheads, and sure. I'd be out there tagging along. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found quite a few. We uh, got most of the things by hand in those days, of course. Everything, uh, pitchforks and shovels and spades, and that's how we did it. The hay was pitched on in the field. It was pitched off at home and loose hay. Loose hay. Yeah. 
Um, did you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister. Okay. And she's, uh, her name is Dallas, and she still lives up at Meadow, South Dakota, which is close to Bison. And uh, it was kind of interesting. She's older, a little bit older than I am, about eight years plus a little. And she graduated from high school in 1940 and went to Detroit hmm. and lived with her aunt. And uh, she got a job with Borden's. It was a milk company that mm -hmm. still delivered milk with... L.C. the cow. Yeah, uh, uh, delivered milk with a uh, horse and wagon. And uh, she had a little... They bought her a little Ford Coupe, 1940 Ford Coupe, and she went around and picked up the money from the store. That was her job. Okay. And uh, then World War II came along, and, and she uh, went to work in a factory. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, I think she was making springs. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, she uh, she came back to Bison in the late forties. Mm -hmm. Got married in nineteen forty nine and lived in Meadow ever since. Mm -hmm. In town or on a ranch? Well, or a farm. <laughs> it's a farm on the edge of Meadow. Isn't very big, you no, know. No, I know. It's <laughs> pretty hard to be uh, considered urban in Meadow. It, well, <laughs> Meadow used to have. Uh, a hotel and two grocery stores and a lumber yard and sure. a bunch of other things and of course that's all gone now. Yeah, a lot of small towns have gotten smaller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you uh, you do remember the the nineteen thirties? Yes, the I do. Dust bowl conditions up there. Was it? Were there a lot of people up there up in, the, in that part of the state that lost their land at that time? A lot of them did. Of course, there was uh, the Homestead Act brought a lot of people out there, and and they came out and and lived on their 160 acres, and uh, built a sod house, of course. And the remnants, a lot of those are still there if you know where to find them. And uh, I've uh, Marty McGrain, who used to work for the statewide, came out there one year with his metal detector, and and uh, we'd done a lot of little snooping around, and we went to one of these. We found a hairpin and a cartridge from a, a twenty-five twenty rifle. <laughs> I got one of those that belonged to my dad. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a lot of those people, of course, just couldn't make it on 160 acres, even, you know, probably in good times. Uh, it certainly couldn't now. But, uh, you know, the land was acquired, and there was different government programs, and some of them borrowed money and couldn't pay it and lost it, and... And uh, but uh, my folks uh, stuck it out. We uh, <clears throat> we had a creek that run through the through the farm, and uh, Dad uh, the creek was dry, but there was a spring in it, mm -hmm. and he, he built a, a an arbor out over the creek and put a engine and a pump jack on it and dug a hole down there and got some water in it and we raised a big garden, and so we always had plenty of food. And uh, we provided food for a lot of the neighbors, I guess, in some ways, you know, vegetables and melons and a lot of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we was, even though it was dry and there was no crop, we were, we were raising something. People had to, uh, to, to be um, more self-reliant, I suppose, in those days than today. Um, they would. It seems to, to seem maybe perhaps people were more self reliant in those days than now. Oh, yeah, they were. And uh, probably with the with the with expectations not maybe so high as people have today, so they could survive something like that. Well, they didn't have a lot of bills to accumulate. Yeah. You know, in those we never had a telephone mm -hmm. uh, until probably in uh, I don't know thirty. It was when I was in grade school, probably 38, I'd guess, somewhere in there, 37, 38. And there was no electric bill, there was mm -hmm. no gas bill. I mean, we hauled coal and burnt wood. And uh, it was just as long as you had food and fuel, mm -hmm. you were in pretty good shape. The, there was no refrigeration, of course, so all the, we'd butcher, you know, and uh, all the meat was canned. And we had a, everybody had a cellar mm -hmm. where you put the potatoes and the carrots and the beets and the meat and the whole business would be down there on shelves and bins. And mm 
Mm-hmm. Was this right under the house or? No, no, ours was separate. Oh, yours was out in the yard. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Some places yeah. they call those caves. Yeah. Down you could call it that too. Yeah. I guess that might be a better name. Had a little wooden entry on it, you know, mound of dirt and a vent in the top. And, yeah. and uh, down yeah. south, maybe people use those as refuge from tornadoes too. Yeah. You used to burn a lantern out there, a, a kerosene lantern, to keep it from freezing in the wintertime. Mm. Okay. Just that sat on the step, and that's all it took. How deep were those things? Oh, this one, I suppose, uh, it was about, I suppose, six to seven feet. Mm-hmm. And then it had a had an arched wooden roof over it, and it was covered with dirt. And... So was that a regular process of keeping that lantern lit? In the wintertime, mm-hmm. when it was cold, if, you know, if it was real cold. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was pretty well insulated uh, with dirt, and of course it was underground. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, as I remember, the lanterns sat on one of the steps leading down into this thing. The steps were dirt, of course. <laughs> okay. So you're uh, you're growing up up there. Did you go to country school up there? Yeah, I went to uh, Lone Tree School. It was about a mile from the farm. And uh, we walked back and forth every day. We lived in a really small house. It had, uh, well, a, a living room and a kitchen and a little bedroom. I suppose the whole thing, I never measured it, but I suppose it might have been uh, maybe 20 by 30. Mm-hmm. More probably like maybe 28. And then when I came along, they run a little shack up to the back of it and cut a hole in the back wall and put a door in it. And An that was my room. But when I was going to grade school, uh, the first uh, teachers, uh, let's see, the, my third, fourth, and fifth grade teacher, uh, and even before I went to school, they stayed at the farm. And they, of course, they got the little bedroom on the back, and I got to sleep on the old army cot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was interesting. The teacher, the first year, my third grade teacher got $45 a month. And then they raised his pay to $55 a month. And he lived at the farm. I mean, the folks uh, boarded and fed and boarded him. I don't know what he paid, but... It couldn't have been much, mm-hmm. maybe five dollars a month. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so growing up up there, what did you aspire to do? Did you did you want to rent farm when you were a kid? Well, that was I think that was probably the original thought. I had never really uh, given it a whole lot of thought when I graduated from high school in 1949. I went to Brookings for two years. And uh, got married, moved to the farm. That was in 1952. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had the worst hailstorm in August uh, that I've ever seen. And uh, when it was all over, the crop was gone. Mm-hmm. So I had to find a job. Mm-hmm. By the way, how, how much land did you have up there? 1,160 you? acres. Was that... Uh, a little bit bigger than the particularly, I suppose, for the first settlers, that would have been very big, but later on it would probably be getting smaller all the time. Uh, so yeah, to begin with, uh, the farm was not that big, but it was that big by 1949, but yeah. Dad had bought yeah. some, of the some pieces of land, had, yeah. That had lost their farms and so on. And he had an opportunity to buy his dad's place for four dollars an acre but you know after the 30s uh, my folks and a lot of others were just didn't want to go in debt mm-hmm. you know they were we were scared to go in debt and they did so he didn't do it if, if he had of uh, been a good move the farm would have been a lot bigger and my life would have probably been entirely different <laughs> mm-hmm. but I'm not complaining about that but I you know the, the circumstances sometimes even though they may not be significant at the time, uh, do change people's lives. Sure. Were your uh, was your family involved in cooperatives up there at all? 
Well, uh, oh, were, were there cooperatives up there? Then? Oh yeah, the the uh, Lemon Equity yep. was in Lemon. Mm -hmm. There was none in Bison. Mm -hmm. With Equity, that probably is a relatively early co-op. Uh, well, it was there for as long as I can remember, mm -hmm. and Dad always bought his fuel there. Yep. And it was, of course, it was a it was a copper cooperative, and you know there was always a little dividend there from the fuel purchases, which was always welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we sold. Uh, most of the grain there in the early years, I think we sold it all there. And uh, there was no elevator in Bison, of course, at that time. There, there is now and has been for 50 years, but in those days there wasn't. Mm -hmm. Is that Bison elevator a cooperative? No, yeah, I didn't privately so. owned, no. Was there a lot of uh, attitude up there? Uh, there, you know, back in, in the earlier days, there were some people that had uh, felt that uh, somehow cooperatives were socialist or something like that. And, oh, I think there was some of that feeling. Uh, you had a bunch of, you had a, later on, you had a bit of the John Birch Society up in that. Oh, area. yeah. They were, they were strong. I faced them many times mm -hmm. at meetings, you know, where they had challenged the 2% interest and things like that. And, but I always kind of enjoyed those confrontations because I got to say a lot of things I wouldn't otherwise have said. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, we, we talked about the, the arrival of uh, the rural electric up there and, and electricity. Uh, what was the process of getting the, 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 the cooperative started up there? Uh, Grand electric. Uh, well, it was, diff it was a difficult one. Uh, John Reedy who ended up being president of the board uh, for Grand for 41 years, was the really the prime mover. He, he and the, some of his friends and associates were the Farmers Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they wanted electricity and, and uh, they weren't gonna give up till they got it. It took a while. I, they were incorporated in 1946, mm -hmm. the cooperative was. And uh, it never got actually going until 1949. They started construction, and the system was energized on the 10th of April, 1950. And that was included the area from Lemon and down to Bison and, um, you know, some rural lines, And but mm -hmm. that was the beginning of it. And it, did it take a while after that to reach all the various uh, farms and ranches out in the... Uh, the last uh, major section, it was pretty much one section after the other one. The first one was A, and then there was B and C and mm -hmm. D. The last one was F, and by that time I was there, I'd done the right-of-way work on the F section. That was 19, uh, 1956, 55 and 56. And uh, that was the area southwest of uh, Faith for the most part, and then we picked up... Uh, Oh, quite a few, you know, just isolated uh, pieces of line where people had passed electricity up to begin with and decided it wasn't such a bad deal after all and wanted to get on. Mm -hmm. Out in that area, was, was there, were there finally anybody who didn't, who declined to get hooked up? Oh, yes. Yeah, there was people that passed it up. There was. They just, you know, $10 a month, they just couldn't see it. Um, I think you, you, did you talk a little bit about, uh, before about, uh, about, uh, the, the, you getting electricity hooked up at your farm? Yeah, we got uh, electricity on the farm in, uh, in July of 1950. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were on the original A section. That was part of the original, uh, first section that was built. And uh, I was about a three miles away cutting hay on the day they set the meter. And at noon, I unhooked the tractor and went home and uh, see if we had lights in the barn. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what sort of, uh, did, did, uh, did you acquire a bunch of stuff ahead of time, uh, electrical appliances and that sort of thing, or did you slowly accumulate it afterwards? Slowly accumulated. Uh, b bottle gas, propane came along, you know, after World War II, mm -hmm. and the folks bought a new refrigerator and a new range. Okay, so you had uh, 
of the range in the refrigerator before then? Mm -hmm. the yes. Yeah. That was in, uh, oh, I'd say probably 46 or 7, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was after World War II. And uh, that refrigerator and range is still out there. Not used anymore, but they used that refrigerator for, I don't know, 30 years anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was it uh, more of a... A blessing for your parents than you. I mean, you would live without it for a while, but they had gone a lot longer. Uh, your dad was what, eighteen ninety-five? Then he'd be in his mid fifties. He was uh, fifty-four years old. Mm -hmm. We got electricity. Yeah. Did 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 people back then uh, r realize how much their lives were going to be changed by uh, electricity? No, I don't think they did at all. You know, the, the of course, nobody had anything. Uh, there was some people that had uh, wind charges, and then there was some generators. We never had any of that stuff. But, uh, of course, they had electricity, but most of those appliances wouldn't wouldn't work on AC. They were DC-operated. So it was mostly, uh, it was basically starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people were just so happy to have lights and not have to fool around with the gas, the high test gas and the kerosene and carrying the lantern to the barn and, and uh, you know, every place else you went after dark, you, you, you had the lantern with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did people have a different approach uh, to uh, getting their house wired? Did some maybe wire it ahead of time and other ones wait until right up to when the electricity was going to be? Hooked up? Well, there was, uh, I think there was some of both. Uh, one of the problems, of course, uh, was getting it done. And uh, there, there was a really, I guess, a shortage of electricians in the, in the short run because there was, everybody had to have the whole place wired. And um, those places, of course, were easier to wire than they are today because most of them didn't have any insulation. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, our house never had an ounce of insulation in it ever. So it was pretty easy to string the wire through the rafters and whatever else. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a number of c contractors that came in, and wiring contractors that sort of followed the line contractors. But even at that, it, t it took time. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did people uh, tend to not put in as many electrical outlets as they would ultimately need? Never, nobody did. I mean, if they had one and one in the room, they were happy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine all the things that they might want to plug in something? Yeah, no way. Um, how about other uh, rural organizations up there besides the co-op? Were your parents involved in, in any of the other? Uh... Well, not really actively. I mean, they done business yeah, yeah. with them. Uh, one significant thing about Grand is that the Grand Electric Board decided that we should have telephone service too. Mm -hmm. And so they acted as a, uh, a organizing board and incorporating board uh, for the West River Cooperative Telephone Company. Mm -hmm. And so they were instrumental in you know getting that organized. And uh, that didn't... Uh, really come to to uh, a beginning until even though they organized probably uh, well probably about 1953 maybe somewhere in there uh, and eventually bought out the Sorum Telephone Company which was something that had to happen in order for it to to work we were really sparsely settled up there. We had less than one in the electric and the telephone density when we finally built the system, including the town of Bison, uh, was 0 0.7 subscribers per mile line. So anyway, uh, they incorporated and uh, then they appointed us a separate telephone board. And that was kind of from all over the Grand Electric area because, you know, the original idea was that it would cover the same territory. Mm -hmm. And it ended up not doing that. When it finally got going, it was different. And so some of those directors were dropped off and new ones were put in their place. And uh, the telephone co-op never actually got going until 1958 when they bought the Sorum Telephone Company. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then the process of uh, extending lines to the countryside? That didn't, that started in 1960. 60, okay. Yeah. But we served the town of Bison a little bit bef before that, we, when we took over the old farm. I got a mm -hmm. picture in there that you'll really appreciate. Okay. Of the old system, <laughs> what we bought. And that, uh, is that the only system in South Dakota where the, the office is for, for both the telephone cooperative and the rural electric is together? It's the only one that exists today. When I was uh, manager, first manager in 1961, there were three. Mm -hmm. The one at, um, at uh, Salem, McCook, yeah. and the one at Wall. Yeah, yeah. And, and us. Now, those two have both separated, and the one up there is still joint. And when I left Grand, of course, that was the end of my joint manager responsibilities. But I think there were only eight left in the United States that operated that way. And I'm not sure how many are still left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not did, many. Did that work pretty smoothly? or? It did. It was a matter of economics. Yeah. Both were, you know, really sparsely settled, and there was some, some things to be gained uh, by using the same people to do two jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just a way to get it, get it done. And of course, things are quite different today. As I understand it, the the original rules for for the uh, rural electric program would have kind of specified more people per mile of line than you would have had up there, right? <laughs> Well, it didn't really specify yeah. how many per mile, but the, what they were interested in was feasibility. Mm -hmm. In other words, you got so many people and your minimum is this, are you going to be yeah. able to pay the government back? Yeah. And that was really the test. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we did some things. When I signed people up in that last section of line, uh, if there was a house there, uh, it got signed up. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, you know, and we weren't really trying to play games, yep. but we were trying to show, uh, you know, as great a potential for, for density and number of consumers as we could. Sure. Uh, I, I keep having to back around a little bit because I'm following my little script of questions here, but uh, <coughs> uh, I, I don't think we talked about high school. Did you go to high school in, in Bison? I went to high school in Bison. Graduated in 1949, mm -hmm. and then I went to college in Brookings for two years. Okay. And then it was back to the farm. Mm -hmm. And is, you haven't mentioned it, but uh, no military service there. Uh, no. I had a slight <clears throat> case of, <clears throat> of polio when I was young, and it, mm. it kind of wrecked one of my knees a little bit. Mm. When did you have that then? Nobody knows. Mm. It was, uh, that's a, a Mayo Clinic diagnosis. It was never detected, and they, they said in those days anyway that that was possible to have that happen. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, for lack of a better explanation, that was uh, why they didn't take me into the service. Okay. I, although I did participate in ROTC when I was in college, and I love to shoot, you know, and you mm -hmm. <clears throat> born on the prairie up here, you kind of born with a gun in your hand. And, mm -hmm. Army RO ROTC? Yeah. And uh, I didn't, uh, well, I didn't know what was going to happen militarily, but mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, what's your wife's name? Uh, Carol. Okay. Uh, I've I've been married twice. Oh, you have okay. My original wife's name was was Hazel. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, kids? Two kids, son Larry, uh, and daughter Janet. Mm hmm And yeah. you think you said your son was still on the farm up there? Well, he's <clears throat> he has the farm, and they farmed it for twenty five years, and <clears throat> he finally got. <clears throat> He got out of the farm, uh, you know, living there, moved to Rapid City, and he now works uh, for a Coal Banker. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, 
kind of bouncing around as we are. Your 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 first job with Grand Electric was uh, was that your first job? Yeah. Okay. And you, you mentioned getting working on the right of way. Uh, you didn't have to clear trees from the right of way, obviously, up in that country. Not very many, no. My original job actually was uh, was uh, <clears throat> working from the ground, and you know, mm-hmm. in those days, uh, we kind of taught ourselves to be linemen, mm-hmm. and uh, so I did that, and uh, I did a lot of mechanic work for him, mm-hmm. and uh, things went along kind of rapidly there. Then they kind of got me started staking line and doing work inside the office with, with work orders and construction and that sort of thing, and I had uh, quite a few titles over the years, mm-hmm. but uh, I used to to climb poles along with, part, as part of the line crew, mm-hmm. and uh, then it was uh, engineer and assistant to the manager and, and manager in 1961. 61. And that was a manager of both the telephone thing, which was all going by then as well. As yes, the the electric co-op in those days uh, operated the uh, well. They done all the hi- the hiring and the mm-hmm. the manager and that sort of thing. And uh, whoever they hired also part of that deal was uh, to manage the telephone co-op, and that was done through an agreement between the two organizations. But the the telephone board wasn't. Involved in the hiring process. Mm-hmm. Who was the Who was the manager before you were out there? Uh, Leroy Schultz. Oh, okay. Did you uh, Did you have any uh, uh, role model, or was he Where was he at as far as uh, as uh, how you managed when you when you took over? Well, of course, I I. Uh, That'd be the only experience you had, I think. Yeah, well, I I was pretty much involved. Uh, he was, uh, I mean, we worked, we worked well together, and uh, we had our differences at times, but mm-hmm. he was uh, he was a sh- intelligent guy. He was an engineer for the, for the uh, engineering firm that had originally designed the system, done the first engineering on the system, mm-hmm. so... Uh, the first manager, the manager that actually hired me, was Abner Thorson. Okay. And he left there in 1955, and uh, then Schultz came. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'd done some things organizationally. Uh, you know, the early days, everybody kind of manager give direction to everybody. You know, he trying to manage the line department, and the office, and the whole business. And in the uh, late 50s. When Bud came, we we uh, departmentalized and wrote position descriptions, and and I did all that, and I did a lot of the engineering work, uh, staked a lot of the line and a lot of the mapping, and designed substations and laid them out, and so I was really my uh, that was really my education in electrical engineering uh, was. Uh, was uh, things that I acquired in working with uh, with Bud. Mm-hmm. Was that pretty common in those days? People learning a lot on the job. Oh, I think a lot, a lot of previous experience, at least in the rural area. Yeah, it was. There was no real in the early days. There was no training programs. I mean, we had our national association, but they hadn't really developed, mm-hmm. uh, you know, their management training programs so like they do today. They got workshops and seminars on practically everything, if not everything. And the telephone, of course, didn't have anything cooking. And, of course, we didn't have much going either, so the electric was predominant. Mm-hmm. But uh, And we had a statewide, you know, job training and safety program, but it was pretty, uh, I mean, pretty uh, preliminary uh, compared to what we have today. It was uh, mostly... Uh, Learning how to survive out there, <laughs> putting your grounds on and you know that type thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long was it uh, 
before you hit, you had your first big storm up there that resulted in power lines going down or and or uh, telephone lines. They were all above ground in those days. Uh, the first big storm was on Mother's Day in 1965. We uh, we lost about 565 poles, as I recall, pretty much all over the system. And, I mean, we were snowbound. Mm -hmm. This was on a Saturday night. Mother's Day was Sunday. Monday morning, Sunday we couldn't do anything. It was just too much snow. Couldn't get around. Monday, the they started clearing the highways, and the guys did what they could do. But we had six airplanes lined up. And the first thing we did was plowed the airport. And... Uh, we inventoried the whole system in one day with those six airplanes. And we, everybody, uh, we, we each had our map in our area that we covered, and we brought it in. We put that map together again, and we worked all night. And by the next morning, we, were, we had our areas assigned, one, two, three, four, five, and we were calling people in and... And uh, getting ready to put her back up. How long did that process take? Uh, it took us about six days. I mean, we we done it in uh, pretty pretty rapid fashion. And of course, we'd never faced anything like this uh, before. But we decided uh, to do it permanently. Not go out and cobble. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the, the theory was that everybody knows how to do it right, and nobody really knows how to do it wrong. So they slap it together, and then you got to go out and redo the whole thing. That's more outages, more disruption. Mm -hmm. And we cleaned up the right of way. And maybe it took a little time to do that, but in the final analysis, uh, it uh, turned out to be really good because when we were done, we were done. And um, yeah, I can remember that reading the disaster manual with one hand and being on the phone with the other, <laughs> calling for help. <laughs> so how often did that kind of thing happen up there? You Well, it's happened quite a few times since then. Yep. And uh, the worst storm was in 1982, and we lost uh, oh, about 1,350 poles that time. And uh, we, but we done it pretty much the same way. In that case, we did have to do a little cobbling because we just simply couldn't uh, couldn't get around. But for the most part, uh, if we could do it permanently, we did that. Uh, we got in a big flap with REA over that. They called me. Well, I called them because we really, according to the law, and the, we were entitled to a two percent disaster loan, and they. So I called them and told them, you know, that we've had a bad deal out here and we expect us to come in for a loan. Well, they called me back the next day. We didn't even have this total system inventoried yet and told me that we wouldn't be eligible for one. That, that was during the uh, Reagan administration? That was during the Reagan administration. Reagan Harold Hunter was... Those loans, period, right? Uh, well, they, what they did, they took our annual report for the end of the year and we, we collect for the range well a year in advance. We had you know, in the neighborhood of 1,300 of them. Mm -hmm. And all that revenue was in there, see? And they counted that against us. But it was revenue for the following year. But, I mean, we never changed their mind. We never got that loan. And, uh, you know, that cost uh, grand probably a million, maybe more than that, in, in extra interest charges. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that was just, that was an administrative decision, and uh, it was... Uh, it was not proper. Uh, I testified against them or in oversight hearings, uh, not against them, but um, about their shortcomings. Yeah. And uh, I guess I didn't make any friends there, but I probably didn't have any anyway, so I didn't think I lost a whole lot. <laughs> Far different than the original REA. They were there to help us, and boy, they did. But it changed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um... What about uh, uh, statewide issues? Uh, 
Did, do, were you dealing with any of that kind of thing? I know John Reedy was the, uh, wasn't he the prime author of the Territorial Integrity Bill? Mm. No? Mm. Was it? Okay. No, no. No, that was in 19... We had the Fair Play Bill, and I think that was in yeah. 1963. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there was one in the 70s, uh, right? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what year that was. I know the Fair Play thing was in 1963, and that yeah. was the big mm -hmm. issue there was, you know, we continue to serve the areas that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And that was a real, uh, you know, that was a real flap. And yeah, they were, what, having the city limits changed and then saying you couldn't serve those areas? Uh, yeah, were they annexed areas? Mm -hmm. Uh, where the electric co-ops had lines, you know, they wanted, they thought they should be able to serve that whole thing. Yeah. Was that an issue for you up in your area, or was it more around, say, Rapid City or Sioux Falls? Uh, much more of an issue around Rapid and Sioux Falls and, and you know, the other cities. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was not an issue for us except for Lemon, and uh, yeah. MDU served there, and it was not really a big thing there because they just, in those days, there just simply wasn't much going on yeah. outside the city limits. And, yeah. I think I looked at that different. I always uh, argued uh, a little differently uh, than some of my friends, uh, you know, saying that I, you know, I just think this is something we got to do, is establish some boundaries and then, you know, go to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's finally what uh, happened, was legislation that says we're going to draw lines. And we did that with MDU at Lemon. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, it wasn't a difficult thing. Uh, yeah. In the interim there, we had the South Dakota Electric Mediation Board, which was a product of uh, the legislature. And uh, Virg Harriet and I were the two representatives for the electrics. Mm -hmm. There was two from the municipals and two from the power companies, and then one guy who would be the, be the chairman. And... Uh, but that was ruled, I think that was ruled unconstitutional. Hmm. But we did, uh, we did meet on a number of occasions to review uh, territorial disputes, and it didn't work all that well because uh, the original bill called for two representatives from each, the municipals, the power companies, and the co-ops, and then the, the other guy and we got that changed so that the one that wasn't involved in the dispute wouldn't have representation. And so it would be two from the municipals, which is normally what it was, or mm -hmm. two from the power companies, and then the two from, there was always two from the rural electrics because we were the guys on the outside. And, uh, but it just didn't function well. I mean, you can argue these things, uh, till uh, turn blue and you know, the two on the election side are going to vote that way and the two on the other side are going to vote the other way and the chairman's going to decide. And mm -hmm. so that wasn't always a... And no predictability, I suppose, on, on the fairness of the decision, uh, depending on who the people were, I suppose. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I mean, they... We both had our arguments and, you know, we, we weren't going to give them up and neither were they. Yeah, and, and uh, of course we figured we were right. I mean, we developed the territory, and and we thought that uh, just because they didn't want to serve them to begin with, uh, that they really hadn't earned any right to serve them down the road when things got better and there was good loads and mm -hmm. those type things. Uh, mm -hmm. So in some instances, do uh, and I guess I'm talking about now the way things operate today. I know at, at Huron we had. Uh, a situation where we have a new turkey processing plant, and they ultimately, uh, I, 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 well, I think Dakota Energy finally got the uh, got to provide the service, but it sounded, to, at least in the, reading the newspaper, like it was a choice thing for them rather than mm -hmm. than the, the power companies. Now it's pretty much I I'm I'm not sure just what happens there today, but I think the the consumer. Uh, Choice is really probably what prevails mm -hmm. in most of those in most of those cases. And uh, if the consumer, of course, if 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 the consumer's choice is going to cause a a massive duplication of service or something like that, then mm -hmm. these other issues uh, 
all come up again, you know, and uh, question uh, who should serve. And in most cases, it would probably go to the commissioner to, sure. or to the courts. Mm -hmm. um, what was the uh, relationship with the uh, South Dakota Rural Electric Association? Was that uh, a smooth relationship? It that? was for us. Uh, we were always members, mm -hmm. and we thought that, uh, you know, we needed some central location to deal with with the politics of electrification and mm -hmm. you know training and job training and safety and and uh, those kinds of issues uh, legislative issues state and uh, to some degree national even though we have a national association it's still nice to have a funneling process so you haven't got 33 rural electric co-ops Going in all different going in different directions. Mm -hmm. And you got your power out there. Was that from Rushmore then? No, no. Or East River? No, neither. No, neither. no. Okay. we were always independent. We were always independent. Oh, yeah, okay. we're a member of District Nine, hmm. which is a, a district of in Basin Electric, okay. and us, all the Mavericks, the individual <laughs> distribution cars that didn't belong to a G and T. Or just make up District Nine. Okay. Well, what went on with the decision to be an independent as opposed to uh, people who affiliated with one or the other of the? Well, we were that way to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, Grand's original power supply came from the Bureau of Reclamation, but it was wheeled over MDU. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the late fifties, of course, the Bureau of Reclamation, what was Bureau of Reclamation now, which is now the Western Area Power Administration, said yeah. we. We're going to run out of electricity mm -hmm. in the dams. You guys are going to have to do something for yourselves. And uh, so that was uh, Basin Electric. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a number. I'm, I was one of the incorporators, along with some of my members of my board and lots of others over the, the area. And uh, so that was the beginning of, of Basin. Well... We didn't really, there was no real incentive for us. Uh, we were a part of Dakota's Electric to begin with, which was a G&T. It was headquartered in Bismarck, and it was simply a paper organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the early years of, of uh, Basin, uh, Dakota's uh, became uh, sort of uh, uh, obscure and uh, eventually disappeared but we uh, we resigned from Dakota's Electric because we just didn't think that that uh, it was worth much to have somebody shuffling the paper for us we thought we could do that ourselves and save save some money and money was always always uh, top issue top priority and uh, but we did visit with East River over the years and we visited with Rushmore mm -hmm. and looked at what you know they could do for us. Uh, one of the things that we we would have had to have done was to was to transfer our allocation for Bureau Power um, to the G and T, and we did okay. and we didn't want to do that. We mm -hmm. wanted to be in control of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we did form a G and T. Grand Electric and Morrow Grand formed a G and T in the early 1960s. Uh, well, actually, no, it was before that. It was, uh, it was uh, about the time Basin came on the scene for the purpose of, of uh, doing our G&T thing just between the two of us. Mm -hmm. But we decided uh, not very far down the road that was not a practical thing to do. And so we dissolved planes and went back to our individual operations. Mm -hmm. When did you start getting power from, from Basin then? When did they get no, their first uh, late night plant the up? first plant came on in 1966. And uh, that's, of course, when we started to buy power from them. Uh, I don't know how it is today, but your your maximum load had and versus your allocation uh, determined how much you would buy. Mm -hmm. Uh, from each, and there was one instance after we'd started to buy from Basin because of the formula that we 
no longer, we, it was a year when we didn't buy any, actually buy any power from Basin, which was sort of a crazy uh, yeah. thing. I don't remember exactly what happened there, but it was because of this formula. And I remember George Parasquivo, who was, who was uh, one of Basin's engineers, uh, and talking to him, I, I just told him, uh, said I didn't realize it was so easy to get out of Basin Electric. Of course, I was, <laughs> I was just kidding, but he, <laughs> remember he got quite a kick out of that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at the state level, you served on uh, the legislative committee. Is that right? Oh, I was on a lot I did of a little research and one of them was reading the... That's the most let's see, is that the most recent one? Oh, okay. That's the most recent one. Oh, all right. I was on all kinds of committees and boards and mm -hmm. over the years. Okay. Montevideo. You were over in Montevideo for a while, huh? Ten years. Okay. Right. Nineteen eighty six to ninety six. Okay. Okay. Uh Okay. So what were the, uh, other than the, that, of course, what were some of the other important issues for the co-op back in the uh, 60s and 70s? Well, um, we were under some assault from the federal government, uh, uh, people who wanted to sell dams and things like that. Well. Yeah, there wasn't so, so much of an effort on that in the in the sixties and seventies, yeah. but there was an always an effort to do away with the two percent interest program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> Grand being, uh, you know, a low density system, high investment system, yeah. we uh, we fought for the continuation of the two percent interest program right to the last day. Even, even when uh, it was decided that we needed to develop our own financing organization, we still we opposed that pretty strenuously and and uh, insisted that you know there was a need at least as great or greater for the two percent interest program than there was in the beginning because mm -hmm. you know uh, much higher costs, uh, density is the same. Uh, people are moving out uh, and all of that, and uh, we finally uh, lost the, the struggle, but the uh, thing that did happen is that we preserved the 2% interest program for a number of years where if we had not made that effort, we would have lost it sooner. Mm -hmm. It would have cost you a lot of money. And it would have cost us and systems like us mm -hmm. a lot of money. There was only 14 co-ops out of 932 or whatever it was with a lower density than Grand. Yeah. We were number 14, so we're down at the bottom of the yeah. density ring. Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard to look around the country and think where there might be areas that might have less people per mile and maybe parts of Nevada, I suppose. They were splattered around. It was maybe one, I think there was a one or two in Montana, and Nevada yeah. was one of them, and I think there was one or two in Texas. And mm -hmm. I knew where they all were. If I dug around, I could find it. I used to <laughs> study that stuff pretty... Uh, Pretty uh, vigorously. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you participate in uh, in a lot of uh, the NRECA lobbying trips to Washington? Or? I did. Yeah, the uh, because of our uh, situation, you know, at Grand and West River, both uh, uh, the boards felt that it was really important for us to uh, to be active, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> we always thought we had a kind of a special story to tell. And I discovered early on that if you want that story told, you've got to do it yourself. You can say to somebody, you know, we'd like to have you do this for us, but it just isn't the same as doing it yourself. So the upshot of that little bit of education was that the boards, both boards, uh, wanted me to be involved in politics and, and legislation, and uh, so that's what I did, and I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Do you have any particular stories from lobbying trips to D.C.? Well, one of my uh, one of my favorite ones. Well, there's a couple really. Uh, when I was first manager, we were the missile sites were coming on the scene, 
and the uh, Black Hills Power and Light was proposing to build out into the country, mm -hmm. up in Meade County and Butte County, and where they never would have gone. And uh, anyway, uh, I became manager on the 10th of June in 1961, and, and this was going on. And it wasn't but a few days after that that, that uh, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, by myself. The rest of the guys were, I think, in Omaha at off at Air Force Base because there was four co-ops plus Rushmore that was involved. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm supposed to go and talk to the representatives, the congressmen, REA. I didn't have the faintest idea how to go about this. But I had met a guy by the name of Charlie Robinson who was uh, worked for NRECA, and he had a, a, a degree in engineering and a in degree in law. And when I got to Washington, I called Charlie up and I told him what my problem was. And uh, so he shut his office down, he came in and spent the day with me. And uh, what I discovered was that you talk to congressmen and those people, uh, it's like you talk to anybody else, you know. Mm -hmm. Tell them what's going on and, you know. Anyway, uh, that was a real learning experience for me. The other one was, uh, and this involved my good friend Frank Butler. Uh, we were... Uh, and this was when Kennedy was president, of course, and, and Frank knew all these guys. And a guy by the name of John, I can't come up with his last name right at the moment. Anyway, this is in the, was in the fall, and we were, we were uh, on the verge of losing this territory, this thing, to the Black Hills Park and Light. And anyway, I had to go to Washington, and, and I wanted to see all these administration people, you know. Frank knew most of these guys. Ken Holm and mm -hmm. John Baker was the guy's name, John Baker. Oh, yeah. John. Anyway, Frank is out combining. Mm -hmm. And I just I couldn't think of anybody that could get done what we needed to do, getting to see these guys, except Frank. So I went out and talked to him. He's cutting wheat. And I told him what the problem was. I said, will you go to Washington with me? He said, yeah. Uh, he said, if you can get somebody to run my combine. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, I'll be back in an hour. We had a young guy working for us. He was doing some, make, drawing some maps. And his dad kind of was, uh, had a farm. And, you know, I thought maybe he knew something about farming. So I went back to the office and I said, Dean, I said, uh, you know anything about combines and harvest and all that? And he said, no. I said, you're just the guy I'm looking for. Get your coat <laughs> and cap. We're, we're going farming. <laughs> so I took Dean out there, and Frank showed him how to run the combine, and the next morning we left for Washington. Uh, and Frank got me in to see all these guys, you know, and so I got a chance to tell my story. And uh, there are not many guys who would do that. I mean, he's out there making his living. And uh, I just, uh, I always admired that. You know, there are not many people would uh, say, okay, uh, I'll let somebody that never seen my combine or one before uh, do my harvest and I'll go and do something for the good of the, good of the cause. Mm -hmm. Well, that was always kind of a favorite story. And when it was all said and done, um, not necessarily just because of that trip, but, but other things that we did, uh, we finally won the battle. But it was not an easy one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a second uh, story? Well, that was... Uh, or was this two combined? <laughs> that was kind of two of them combined. It all kind of dealt with the same thing. But okay. the, because it was an early, uh, an early initiation into the, some of the difficulties of uh, getting things done and working with the, the legislative mm -hmm. political scene and... Sure. Uh, the the fair play thing, of course, the legislative thing in South Dakota, that was a big thing uh, in 63. I mean, this really got pretty nasty. And we spent quite a few days in Pierre. And uh, interestingly enough, Virg Harriet and I were the only two guys 
the camp down there in the St. Charles Hotel along with the SDRE Legislative Committee. Uh, you know, Grand as an individual organization didn't have a whole lot at stake, but as a part of the rural electric program as a whole, we had we did have a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. And uh, my board wanted me to do it, and I was interested and wanted to do it, and so it was uh, it was uh, interesting, and you know it took took a few years, but mm -hmm. we got it done. You know, it it took uh, eight years to get an enabling act in the state of South Dakota for the electric program. Then our uh, one lopsided legislature just couldn't see letting these co-ops go out and do things. But I mean, there were systems that came on before that, but they'd done it without an enabling act. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you probably had a majority of rural representation, didn't you? Well, we, I think we probably did. It was certainly a lot uh, more rural than it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We hadn't yet had the one man, one vote decision from the Supreme Court, so... You could have districts that didn't have the same number of people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that, again, I'm not really familiar with that, but I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, community issues? Did the cooperative get involved in, in any of those kind of things? Well, we did. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, that kind of developed. I mean, Grand was the place in town that that had the the machines, the people uh, and you know the capability to do things for the community that the community couldn't do, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, we always tried to help out in that way. Uh, when town really needed something, uh, they would come, and uh, you know, if, uh, we had two towns, Bison and Buffalo, mm -hmm. and in my years as manager, I always kind of tried to. To keep a balance, you know. I mean, we we was headquartered in Bison, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I didn't feel right about spending all the resources that was available for those kinds of things just in Bison. So, you know, we tried to, and we did have an outpost in Buffalo, but I tried to, you know, kind of balance the the uh, assistance as much as I could. Um, was managing a, a cooperative system? different out here than it was uh, in East River, South Dakota, where there were more people? Uh, were, there, were there things that made it different than dealing well, with it? Well, yeah, yeah, I think it was. Uh, density was a big thing, an investment per consumer, or, uh, which is a part of that, uh, was important. And we always uh, put a lot of emphasis on planning. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we made an annual work plan, and we didn't sit down and and say, "Well, we're going to increase this eight percent." We we put down everything we wanted to do during the year, and how many people it was going to take to do it, uh, and uh, our budgets were almost always within one percent, and we didn't we didn't try to finagle the thing to make it look that way. I mean, we just uh, now it was felt that that was a testimony to the the job that our people did uh, in pricing things out and you know really saying this is what we're going to do and and uh, I know a lot of systems didn't do that As a matter of fact I don't know of any system really other than probably maybe Sioux Valley and maybe a couple of others that I don't know about but that went to that much effort to plan and uh, it was just, uh, and, and it worked for us. Um, then we come up to the, the 1980s, and uh, um, you had more attacks on the rural electric program from the Reagan administration. Uh, it, what was your experience with those? Did you take part in some of the efforts in D.C. lobbying on those things? Oh, yeah. We always went. I mean, we had our annual... They were going to sell the dams, I think, at that point. Uh, they were going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they still kind of like to do that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we we opposed that with all the vigor we could muster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was... Uh, well, I just, you know, I... I uh, 
was on a first name basis always with all of our with our senators and and uh, representatives, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. Were they all pretty united when it came to dealing with those kind of issues? That affected pretty, pretty much. Issues? Yeah, pretty much. In the later, earlier years, that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. E.Y. Berry was no big help. Yeah. And when we got into the missile thing, uh, uh, Case and Munt were still there at that time. And uh, they were, you know, they were helpful in the sense that they I remember getting a telegram, I think it was from Case, saying if you don't do something by Monday morning, uh, it's going to go to the power companies, and this was Friday, you know. <laughs> but uh, I just, I made a lot of trips to Washington. I suppose I made over the years over 100 trips. One of the, I guess there might be another story to this. Uh, he was asking for another story. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. In 1974, in the spring of 1974, the cattle prices were terrible. And one of my rancher friends called me up and said, what can we do about this? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I said, let me do a little research. So I did. And when the agricultural bill came up for a hearing in Washington, there was only one guy there from South Dakota, and that was Ben Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. So we decided to try to do something. Well, I had a couple of uh, friends uh, Bill Matson was one who was originally from South Dakota um, on the Consumer Federation of America board. And, you know, we got to talk, and I was trying to figure out some way to work out an affiliation. And so we, uh, we went to Washington and met with, uh, well, first of all, there was a, the, uh, there was a hearing in, in uh, it was in Salt Lake City. Uh, anyway, even prior to that, we decided to just call everybody in. Stock growers, farmers union, farm bureau. We had a meeting in the basement in Bison. Mm -hmm. And we organized the South, Meat Promoters of South Dakota. And that came from Les Clavin. That was, name was his idea. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, they collected some money and they was having this hearing. It was a McGovern was holding a hearing for the Agriculture Committee in Salt Lake City. So myself and another guy were were dispatched to Salt Lake City, and we went there and uh, and uh, we wrote the testimony uh, on the airplane and and uh, in the restaurant. And by the time the hearing came, we were ready to go. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that gave our testimony. Francis, uh, the guy that was with me, the guy by the name of Francis Veal. He had a ranch, and we were neighbors, actually, uh, for all the years. I've known him all my life. So anyway, from there, then, uh, this thing kind of progressed, and we went to Washington and met with different groups, uh, consumer groups. Uh, I think it was three of them, the Consumer Federation of America was one, but there was a National Consumers Congress, and there was one other one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, because of my friends with the Consumer Federation of America, that's where we decided to settle down and see if we could put something together. And so that's where uh, uh, we kind of developed a relationship with them over the summer. And then in late in the fall, we met, in, I think it was in Detroit, uh, with, with uh, the president of CFA. And I don't remember who the director, I think it was Carol Foreman. Was yes, it? I believe it was. Uh, the director. Anyway... We went to Washington then in November, and we decided to do this beef, beef end thing. Mm -hmm. and of course, my board had told me, you know, I told them, I said, these guys want me to help me. What do I want me to do? They said, well, help them if you can. So, I mean, here I am, you know, <laughs> spending all my time on this <laughs> and trying to manage to co ops besides. But anyway, we went to Washington, I think it was early in November, and we decided to do this beef end thing where we took the 47 head of cattle and we put them on the mall right across the, the street from Butts' window. It was right east of the Washington Monument. Okay, not unlike the area where the tractor cage guys went later on. Yeah, well, they got their idea from us. Mm -hmm. There was one big difference. Yeah. Is that when we went, 
we went with the idea that we were not going to disrupt yep. other people's lives, mm -hmm. and we didn't. Anyway, this was one of the wildest experiences of my life, you know. Uh, we left Bison on the 6th of, of December in 1974 with uh, about 56 people. We had the 47 head of cattle, we had the semi, we had the pickups and the horse trailers and with the feed and the hoses and the water tanks and the whole business. Uh, CFA sent uh, a little gal out to go with us. She came to Bison and we came down rapid and picked her up and bought her a cowboy hat and and then we had these news conferences. The first one was, that was when Knipe was governor. We were done it on the steps of the Capitol. And uh, then it was uh, Sioux City, Juliet, Illinois, Cleveland, and uh, Washington, D.C. And I, I mean, I could talk for, for an hour about this, but the significant thing was that, that uh, you know, we did this together. We, uh, Carol Foreman was a part of this. Uh, she later became the assistant secretary of agriculture for mm -hmm. during the Carter years. Uh, yeah, with, with uh, Bob Berkland. And she was in charge of the food stamp program, some of those things. And uh, you know, I mean, and people didn't. I mean, the, the the ranchers had a little trouble warming up. They're not the guys that was working with us, but people mm -hmm. didn't know her. Yeah. But anyway, I just you know we tried to establish a relationship with with the people that actually eat the product and we had a big sign on the bus that says uh, consumers can't afford to buy us and and uh, farmers can't afford to raise us something like that I've got a picture of that in here somewhere I'll show these to you after a while yeah, yeah. anyway I ended up on the CFA board mm -hmm. in 1975 and uh, I was there for nine years until I left Grand mm -hmm. One of the other crazy things that we did with this group that I did that they uh, was a big argument about what the impact of imported beef was on the domestic market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody knew the answer to that question, really. But we did know that there was a lot of beef coming in from Australia and Argentina mm -hmm. and those places. So uh, we didn't have any money, but we wanted to, wanted to somehow get a hearing before the International Trade Commission. And uh, so, someplace I got a copy of a of a legal document that the guys had used for shoes, and how they presented their arguments to the International Trade Commission. So I gathered a lot of information, and my two rancher friends came in one day, and we, you know, I'd kind of put this thing together, and we finalized a petition mm -hmm. that we submitted to the International Trade Commission with no idea that this thing would be successful. But, uh, I don't know, a month or whatever it was later, I got this thing that said, we've scheduled hearings. Rapid City, Kansas City, uh, Fort Worth, mm -hmm. New York City, Washington, D.C. <laughs> so now, I mean, now we gotta really, now we gotta produce, you know, and get ready for this thing and it was a uh, it was really crazy and we held these hearings and uh, the interesting thing in that was that uh, the cattle organizations um, stock growers uh, the, the uh, American Beef Council that's not the right name they all opposed us they said uh, they testified here in Rapid City that says that that uh, a lot of the beef that comes into this country that comes from Mexico comes in in cans, and it's made f it's made from cattle that have hoof and mouth disease. That was their testimony. So I went, you know, after this all over, I went to the grocery store and looked at some of these cans of of corned beef came from Latin America, Honduras, you know, places like that. And I'm thinking, you know, this comes from cows that had... And they, they just testified to this matter-of-factly. 
like it was something we should really enjoy. I never did like corned beef before, <laughs> and I really like it a little bit less since. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, this whole thing was just, uh, it was probably one of the craziest things I ever got involved in. But it was a, it was an interesting experience. It's sort of a continuing issue, too, because it seems like we continually deal with the uh, effects of imported beef. Nothing much happened, you know, mm -hmm. but out of all that, except that we did, de we did prove. I mean, we went around Washington D.C. with our cowboy hats, and we had our brochures, and mm -hmm. we handed them out to people in elevators and on the street, and yeah. and I mean, these people were, I mean, they were our friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I never forget when we when we came into Joliet, Illinois. This uh, uh, black fellow was tending the door at the Holiday Inn, and he looked at the side of that bus. He said, that's right, he said, uh, you guys do all the work and somebody else makes all the money. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so you continue to be on the uh, Consumer Federation board for... for I was there for nine years. Yeah. yeah. I used to attend the meetings in the 70s and 80s. Uh, yeah. I was there. I saw you there. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so you uh, you left uh, Grand Electric in? Uh, January 31st, 1984. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when did you go to Monte Video right now? No, no. I, I was out of the program for a couple of years. Oh, you were? Okay. I had had some, I had some little property in Sioux Falls, and I started a... A little pizza business down there, a mm. carry out thing. Mm -hmm. And I had a I had a house in Texas I bought just for something to do, I guess. Uh -huh. And I just I had some things I wanted to do and sure. and uh so I did that and the pizza thing didn't work out very good. It wasn't making any money but it wasn't losing any money, it wasn't making any either. Mm -hmm. A lot of competition in the pizza business. Probably. Yeah, and then I uh, so then I went to work for Shagstead Electric. Mm -hmm. I'd done a little management study for them and and uh, operational study, and then they wanted to establish an office out here in Rapid, yeah. and uh, they wanted me to come out here and run that for them. They had lost their franchise with Onan, which was a standby generator. Uh, company and so they took up with Kohler right away. Well, they had a franchise for Western South Dakota, Eastern Wyoming, and Northwest Nebraska with Kohler. And uh, anyway, unbeknownst to me, they were they were uh, negotiating with Onan to get their dealership back, mm -hmm. and. Uh, what they originally thought was that that if they did that, that they could sell both, see. Well, they finally did get Onan back. Onan took them back. And, of course, they couldn't... Uh, when Kohler found out about it, I mean, they canceled their franchise, I mean, like right now. I'm in the middle of the day. And I'm sitting out here in Rapid City. <laughs> And uh, they lost their territory. Well. So I'm here with nothing to do, without a job. So I thought, to, it's time to redo this thing, rethink this. And I decided to get back in the electric program. Mm -hmm. And I end up in Montevideo, Minnesota. Okay. Quite different territory than uh, northwestern South Dakota. Well, it it wasn't, it wasn't. There was a lot of similarities. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they were District 9 members of Basin Electric. Okay. Operated that same way. Okay. Had their own transmission system mm -hmm. and all that, and I was familiar with with all that. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, had a better density, about 1.6. Mm -hmm. But you know, I found out the people were basically the same. You know, I just uh, I always enjoyed uh, working with rural people. You know, even though. Uh, I had some that kind of got on my case once in a while when I was at Grand, and mm -hmm. I mean, you could have picked these people out. They were mostly the John Birch Regiment, mm -hmm. those types. 
but most people were really good, and it was a you know it was just a pleasure to to work with them. And I found the people in Minnesota would be the be the same way. Mm -hmm. What kind of issues was uh, were they dealing with over there? What was the name of the, that co-op, by the way? That was Minnesota Cooperative uh, Light and Power. Okay. Which I never was too crazy about the name, but mm -hmm. anyway, uh, yeah, it was the Minnesota Valley Cooperative Light and Power Association. There okay. it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Territory was an issue, and of course, yeah. it was a bigger issue. Uh, at Minnesota Valley, because you had more towns, and uh, the uh, Montevideo was uh, was the biggest one, of course, in our in our area. Now, what was the territorial situation in Minnesota? Was that was the legislative situation better than it had? Uh, not not a lot. I mean, we had uh, they they had a fairly well. I wouldn't call it a decent law, but it was it was better than what we had. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, the issues were the same. Uh, we had some right there in Montevideo, and uh, we we actually took the power company to, uh, before the PUC in a case in Montevideo. I mean, we had service into a business, and they built on, and and uh, Otter Tail built into the to the building right alongside of us. And uh, I told them, if you do this. We're going to court, mm -hmm. and they did it, and we went to court, and and uh, they lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, and you you retired then from over there. I retired from Minnesota Valley mm -hmm. uh, in uh, January of nineteen ninety six. Okay. Um. You you worked uh, in the cooperative system for a lot of years. What did you like about cooperatives? Did you think that allowed them to maybe better serve the needs of people out here? Well, I uh, you know I just thought that it was uh, it was better to do things together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there's a lot to be gained from uh, from doing that in terms of uh, of ownership. Uh, control, having something to say about your business. Um, as far as electric and the telephone co-op went, if they had a problem, they could call me. If you got a problem with the power company, you never get to talk to anybody that can really decide anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got your own board of directors. Uh, you know them. They're your friends and neighbors. Uh, a lot to be said for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just... Uh, I. I just believe that uh, working together, I mean, people that don't really believe in cooperatives do it. Yeah. You know, neighbors help each other brand and round up cattle and farm and do all those things. Mm -hmm. That's cooperation. They don't yeah. look at it as a little co-op, you know, mm -hmm. but in essence it really is. Yeah, um, we uh, pay a lot of lip service to the rugged individual as uh, uh, ideal, but cooperation has actually been a lot more common on the, in the Great Plains and West than individualism was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I found that for the most part, uh, when it comes to the co-op, you know, they said politics aside. That isn't 100% true. Nothing's 100%. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I had a lot of real good friends that were, uh, you know, Republicans, and they probably voted for every Republican that ever ran for president, but when mm -hmm. it came to Grand, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were there for you. Yeah. Uh, uh, challenges that are that face cooperatives have changed over the years. As you look back, you were got in, involved back in the 1950s uh, to the end of your career. Um, did you see a lot of changes in the kind of challenges that were facing cooperatives? Well, uh, well, I'd have to say yes because things are so much different. Mm -hmm. uh, when our original uh, system was built, you could buy a pole, cost you eight dollars. Yeah. Today, that pole is probably more like one hundred and fifty dollars, mm -hmm. and it costs you another two hundred and fifty to put it in the ground. Yeah. 
And uh, in those days, the price of that whole package was about anywhere from 15 even less than that to $20. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cost, and you still got the same number of people. Well, less people, actually, because uh, people have gone down, uh, consumption's gone up. Uh, but you're dealing with a pretty thin margin in terms of manpower and money, dollars, to, to, to get the job done. It just takes, uh, you know, very uh, careful uh, stewardship mm -hmm. to get, be able to pay the bills and, and get the job done. Uh, most of the systems, uh, the one I came from at Grand, there are a lot of those poles uh, that have been replaced. There's also a lot of poles that are still out there that was put in there in 1950, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they're going to have to go. Yeah. And uh, so it's a uh, it's a real balancing act. I think that the, the systems like Grand, it's it's going to be just more and more difficult to uh, keep up because of the replacement and you know those type things and. Uh, you know, rates are probably going to have to go up. The things that are happening uh, um, with with respect to water, hydropower, mm -hmm. they're uh, they're having to go outside to buy energy. There's not enough water in the dams to generate the to meet the. It's their, almost like an old time low rate. Right yeah, to meet the minimum requirements, you know. And if this uh, goes on and on, uh, I'm not sure what the good answer is, but. Uh, uh, people are going to continue to use more electricity. Uh, I can't see that they're not. Uh, whatever part renewable energy plays, uh, wind, I uh, never was too big a fan of that because the, the, the system still has to be able to produce whatever power it takes to run it when the wind don't blow. Yep. And, uh, you know, it might be a good fill-in, but the investment to to deliver still has to be there in terms of, you know, you're not only your local, but in terms of generation and transmission. And, mm -hmm. and I don't see that uh, unless something really crashes that uh, the cost of doing business is going to be any less. Do you, uh, do you think that, um, that if, if the system had not been built, do you think that it could be built today? Do you think the attitudes are, are the same and the people are the same? Would they would they do that? There's a, there seems to be a, today an awful lot of uh, attitude of not in my backyard type thing. It might be difficult to get right away and that kind of thing. Well, it would certainly be much more difficult. You'd have to, I'm, the very least, you'd have to expect to pay for it. Uh -huh. And I just don't think the dollars are there when you think about the far-flung system that Grand has as, as an example. Uh, we never paid for any right away. I think maybe today they may be paying for transmission, a little for transmission, but never anything for distribution. And, mm -hmm. and people didn't care. I mean, they had put it any place that we want electricity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of cutting across. We took the hypotenuse if we could. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the folks I interviewed uh, quoted uh, former South Dakota Farmers Union president to the effect that a right long, uh, the, or that a privilege long enjoyed becomes a right in people's minds. Do you think that young people today understand what was the, what was gone through to to achieve the services that they take for granted at this point? <clears throat> no, well, I think they might they might understand it if they uh, studied it, but I'm not sure they would really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Because I talked to my grandson, who is a good kid, you know, and he's a worker, and he loves that farm. But when I say, well, I was 19 years old before we had electricity on this farm, he doesn't ask me any questions. And, you know, I just, and, you know, I don't think it's any shortcoming on his part. I just don't think you can imagine it yeah. unless you experienced it. And, and maybe that's a function for cooperative education that maybe we need to, to do more. I don't know how you get effectively get that across. Maybe that's something that this program can help with a little bit. 
Well, it could. I think uh, you know a youngster has to be have to be interested in it, and they have to have some reason for wanting to learn about it. Yeah. And that kind of escapes me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. So uh, you know, I know that uh, people come out here and build a sod house. I'm talking about myself now, but for me, you say, well, you know, we come out here and you know we lived in a sod house. You know, it, I might like it as information. It might be interesting to me, but my, you know, what does it really mean to me mm-hmm. other than history? Sure. Probably not much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, NRECA did a, a well, uh, Dick Pants, I think, and, uh, and Harlan Severson wrote, put together the book, The, the Next Greatest Thing, which mm-hmm. is, it's a wonderful book to read, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, maybe we need to do something that something needs to be done on television to educate people on the impact of rural electrification in the countryside in the United States. I don't know that that's necessarily been done as a freestanding thing, maybe as part of a, a New Deal thing or something. But. Well, it's history. Yeah. It's history. It is. And, uh, you know, I, I think it would be... Uh, you know, I think it would be interesting. It would be to me. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how interesting it would be to my 14-year-old grandson. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think that it's worth preserving. Mm-hmm. We've let a lot of the pioneers get away from us. And uh, I've always said we had some real characters in the Real Electric program. That Somebody should have written a book, not about these guys, but about the way things were, you know, and uh, we've lost a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what, uh, what have you been doing since you uh, retired over in Minnesota? You're living here in Rapid City. Yeah. Well, we bought a new house that didn't have anything but mud around it. So uh, we spent a year in the yard, and that's an ongoing thing. We we work there. My wife is uh, great in flowers, and she generally tends to that, and I tend to the rest of it. Mm-hmm. The lower level wasn't finished, so I, I spent a winter mm-hmm. doing that. And uh, when it rained, I spent some time up at the farm in the summertime helping with the harvest, which I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I go fishing. Play quite a, done quite a bit of fishing. Mm-hmm. Hasn't been very good the last couple of years here. I haven't had enough water, but yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. trout fishing here in the hills or uh, oh yeah, both. There's mm-hmm. there's everything, mm-hmm. but uh, if you get back in the hills and the lakes, that's mostly trout. But yeah, and I uh, I uh, see. I played golf. I mentioned that, mm-hmm. and uh, I kind of fuss around. I got quite a few wood tools I I make stuff mm-hmm. which I enjoy doing I like to I like the saw because it cuts things out nice and square and same length yeah. and you put them together and everything fits I like that mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I've done some of that uh, and I volunteer a little bit uh, belong to the Optimus Club and okay. our uh, uh, main effort is to do things for the youth and youth organizations. Yeah, I, I, I belong to the Optimus Club, and you're on the worst struggling right now. Yeah. Because you're on this struggle in a lot of ways. Yeah. But, uh, okay. So we do some things there. We're, we're, uh, we meet every week, and we try to raise some money, and that takes some time because all, all of our labor for doing these things is volunteer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I uh, love to play cribbage. Oh, and okay. so I play, uh, you know, I play twice a week in the winter time, uh, uh-huh. and I play a few tournaments and uh, enjoy that. And I uh, always have done most of my own fixing, you know. Mm-hmm. And I got a boat and I got a fifth wheel and got a pickup and got a car, and they always need something, so mm-hmm. I tinker. Travel. Uh, we've done quite a bit of traveling. Uh, we've uh, been to Alaska and we've been to England and we go south. Uh, well, in the early years when we moved out here, 97, 8, 9, didn't go because we were working on the place here trying to get it finished up. And mm-hmm. 
but now we're back at that again. And we, uh, last year we went to Mexico. Yeah, uh -huh. that was with a caravan group. Had a great trip. And it's something everybody should do once. Do you, do you keep in touch with the Rural Electric Program? I, I, I do. Uh, I still get the Minnesota newsletter, read that. And, uh -huh. and uh, I get the Grand newsletter and the Minnesota Valley newsletter, and I do keep, keep up with it. I'm I, uh, kind of curious about what's going on uh -huh. and who's doing what. You kind of get together with some of the old rural electric other folks that are retired. I know Bob Martin doesn't live too far from you. Here. Yeah, we get together, try to get together. The husbands and wives, managers and wives, get together once a month for dinner. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the guys, we get together once in a while. We get a little place in town here where we can get a $2 hamburger and a glass of beer, you know. Yeah. So we do that. And, and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we see quite a bit of each other. Yeah. And uh, Harvey and uh, Thor Sauter both belong to the Optimist Club too, okay. so that's another another contact. And I uh, I stay in touch with Grand. Mm -hmm. uh, once in a while, I see something that looks interesting. Uh, so, uh, are, would you describe, this is, we're almost to the end of my questions here, would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? I haven't run into very many pessimists. But oh, I think I'm an optimist. I, I hope I am. I belong to the yeah. club and I know what the creed yeah. is, so I better be one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, having said that, you You're know. the first card-carrying optimist I think I've interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, having said that, you know, we don't always practice you know, the way we should. And I think about this every time I read that, we recite that creed on Wednesday morning. That, uh, But generally, uh, I've been, uh, I'm pretty optimistic about life, but I, I've been uh, uh, probably pretty pessimistic about the Bush administration and the people that are running the show. I just uh, think they're mindless. And uh, I, uh, I, r I really find myself uh, in rather, uh, well, I hesitate to call it hate, but it's close. Yeah. It's yeah. repulsive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention, that you'd like to throw in at the last minute? Oh, golly, I tell you, uh, Chuck, there's so many experiences over the years. One thing that I did in 1967 that I never uh, mentioned was that I'd, I led a delegation of people to Europe. Oh, okay. And this was an electrification mechanization tour. Uh -huh. And uh, I got this from a guy by the name of Wendell Binkley, who was the, I think, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture mm -hmm. at the University of Kentucky, but he did some programs for NRECA, some training programs, and we got to be good friends. And he had done this, and he sent this thing to me. And I put it and dropped it in the wastebasket, but then I got to looking at it, and it looked pretty interesting, so I decided to put the trip together. And uh, <clears throat> that, was a, that was a highlight. And my board, uh, we split the we split the time a half vacation, and they furnished the other half. Mm -hmm. Gone for twenty two days. England, Belgium, yeah. Soviet Union, Poland, Hungary, mm -hmm. West Berlin. Wow. Great, uh, great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the iron that was still Iron Curtain time, you know. Yeah. And uh, you could feel it. Didn't nobody had to tell you that you were probably in a place that you were wondering why you were there. <laughs> <laughs> but I and I could go on and on about that trip and some of the things. But uh, the Soviet Union, we were there for six days, and probably one of the biggest observations was that it was security was tight 
they their machinery was just as big as ours. I mean, they had huge tractors and huge machinery. I mean, 50-foot drills and rakes and. Yeah. But before they used that equipment, they put everybody to work. Everybody worked. And uh, the farm that we visited was divided up into brigades, the dairy brigade, the brick brigade, the, the winery, mm -hmm. all separate. And uh, the thing about the dairy brigade was that they milked 300 cows 300 times a day by hand, mm -hmm. all done by women. Yeah. They hadn't moved to milking machines yet? No, nope. done her by hand. <laughs> uh, primitive in a lot of ways, but the thing they did do was uh, they put everybody to work. And, you know, I don't know if that's the best form of government or not, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was interesting. And... Uh, they were, I think, a lot more educated in American ways than we were educated in their ways, and that when we got done with this tour, they had a mm -hmm. gale of dinner, and they had a little guy, a guy playing, I think it was an octonet. Oh. He, like an accordion, he, but smaller? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he knew all the American songs, <laughs> and he played them for us. Now, someplace along the line, he learned those. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of their... Uh, we visited all of their departments of agriculture and those things, and they were they were far behind us in terms of production and facilities and handling and and all of that. The uh, in Belgium, the farmers brought their potatoes in in a wheelbarrow, and they had a big auction, just like we'd sell cattle, and that's how they sold it. And uh, we. In those days, we sent them our chickens, they butchered them and packaged them and sent them back to us. I thought Belgium, you know, would be just teeming with unemployment. Mm -hmm. The truth was that they had to import about 15% of the labor force. And uh, we don't know how easy we got it. The Belgium, Belgium's pretty small, you know. Their children had to go to school and, and do their lessons in four languages. Things like that, you know. We don't, we're not... Uh, Culturally, we're not too well equipped, mm -hmm. and this is true even in the administration. I mean, uh, uh, these people, uh, the you know, the, the foreign countries, uh, they can speak English. Our leaders can't speak their language, uh, <laughs> yeah. so it puts us at a, I think, a definite disadvantage. But anyway, that was a, one of my real loves in life was flying. Mm. I flew practically every place I went. I uh, flew from, uh, well, I took my first lesson in 1962. I got my license in 1964, private license. Then I got a commercial license, and in 1975, I got an instrument rating. And uh, I didn't, well, in terms of time, I logged about 4,200 hours, but uh, I flew almost every place I went. Quit buying cars and bought airplanes, and mm -hmm. discovered that that was financially that was a lot better deal, because you could always sell an airplane for more than you paid for it. But the yeah. cars went the other direction. Yeah, so, but true. it saved me a lot of time and mm -hmm. travel, and nothing was very close to Bison. Yeah. Closest meeting we probably ever had was Rapid City, mm -hmm. of any consequence other than our local stuff. So I uh, transported a lot of people. Over the years, uh, I used to fly our some of our legislative people, Aberesk and Dashiell, and mm -hmm. I never flew McGovern, but I did fly his wife. Okay. I went to Bismarck and got her for a speech she had to give in Lemon, and then took her back. She's not in very good health. That's what I understand. Yeah. But. Uh, I've given that up now, uh, not uh, necessarily because I wanted to, but it was a sort of a collection of circumstances, I guess you'd say. Okay. 
Anything else? Well, you know, <laughs> it's hard to sit down and pull all this stuff well, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I may think of some things. There was uh, a lot of uh, events over the years. The uh, probably one of the well, I did a couple of things that weren't quite kosher. I guess it's everybody knows about it now, but. Uh, in the, in the electric program, when we were going to serve the missile sites, we had a radial transmission line starting in Hedinger, North Dakota, and went to Marine. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had to sign a thing that uh, that said we could serve them. We had the capacity to do it, and it was a pretty borderline proposition. And when we took this trip to Washington with with Frank Butler, we ended up in Ken Holmes' office, and he was Assistant Secretary of the Interior. And I've got this paper with me. I've got to get this thing mailed. And uh, so my my question was, uh, should I sign it or shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. And of course, I was pretty sure I was going to, but I wasn't very comfortable about doing it. And uh, anyway, Holmes said something to the effect that, you know, he'd be inclined to sign it. So I did. The thing he knew that I didn't know was that they were going to build this transmission line from Oahe Dam to Rapid City to Newell to Marine to Eagle Butte and back to Pier. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. He did. <laughs> and so, you know, I was okay in what I did. But when I did it, I wasn't okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was kind of a, that was one. The other thing was, uh, in the te this was in telephone. Uh, when uh, Schultz left, they were had been talking to Bell about buying a, a piece of toll line from Bison to Meadow, which was about 12 miles. And of course, there was no money. You know, I mean, I used to literally sit around at the end of the month and decide who we were going to pay. And I knew, I thought Bud had kind of cleared this thing with REA and all of this. Uh, there wasn't any money in loan funds for it or anything like that, but there, and there had been some discussion. Well. One day, very early in my tenure, <laughs> probably within, uh, might have been just a few months, this guy from Bell comes walking into my office with a bill of sale for that toll line for $13,000. Well, I had done the arithmetic. I knew it was good for West River, that we were going to bring in some badly needed bucks. We didn't have any money, except we did have some in the construction fund. And I called Frank up, and Frank was president of the telephone board. Mm, okay. And I said, here's the deal. Bell's here with a bill of sale for $13,000, and we don't have any money, but I said, we do have it in the construction fund. And of course, you're not supposed to spend money on that unless REA has approved it, see? You're not supposed to use it for undesignated purposes. So I said, if <clears throat> we can buy that. If you're willing to sign that check, I'm willing. <laughs> and so we bought that, wrote that check and bought that. And Gay's REA was furious. <laughs> 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 I was really in the doghouse for quite a while, but they, <laughs> they finally got over it. And uh, so, uh, you know, that was uh, kind of a desperation move on my part because we just simply didn't have money enough to pay the bills. And uh, West River was all <clears throat> was always kind of a favorite with in, with uh, with REA, and uh, telephone was in a separate a separate uh, division. I mean, they had their own mm -hmm. group within REA. And I, on one of the trips, I went to Washington for three things, and I don't remember what the other two were, but one of them was that we needed forty thousand dollars. It was right at the end of the fiscal year. In, in September, early September. And the guy that uh, was the director for our area was a guy by the name of Bill Riley, just miserably crippled up with arthritis, but a prince of a guy. And I went to Bill and I said, you know, we, we, you didn't need to do all the paperwork for $40,000. It was below some minimum, I don't know, 50000 whatever it was. Anyway, he says, I just we don't, I don't have the money. 
There's just no way I can do it. So anyway, I had these three things to do. I come home empty-handed, really, you know, not happy with what I hadn't been able to do. Well, about two weeks later, Bill called me, and he said, I got your money. I said, how did you do it? <laughs> he said, well, he said, I went, went around to the other uh, regions. We were in the northern North Central, and there's the Southwest and the Northwest. No. He said they all had a little money, <laughs> and I I got it from them and put it together, and we we can make you a loan for forty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was it, and you know there wasn't many guys that would have done that, yeah. but Bill did. Yeah. And uh, strangely enough, I even though I don't remember what the other two uh, subjects were. I got them all. When it was all over with, I got them all. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think uh, my battery is about to gonna run out on me here in a few minutes. So, uh, okay. Uh, we've been visiting with Leroy Shecker. Uh, thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project. You bet. It's January 17th. Two, 2000, well, I guess it's January 18th, 2007. Uh, this is an addendum to an interview with Leroy Shecker. Leroy, you've been involved in uh, some additional developments that are pretty important for the cooperative movement. Uh, one of those was, uh, I understand, was uh, you were an incorporator of Basin Electric. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. I was uh, one of the original incorporators of Basin Electric. This was in uh, 1961. And, uh, of course, uh, most everybody around the area, anyway, is familiar with Basin today as being a, a large uh, cooperative generating and transmission cooperative uh, headquartered in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, they provide power for several, several states. The uh, uh, Bureau of Reclamation told us, uh, you know, I mentioned this earlier back in 1950s that we had to do something uh, for future power supply because they had allocated uh, all the power from the dams. And so Basin uh, was the answer to that, and it was the first large-scale coal-fired generation plant in the United States. And it was a pioneer in that field, and uh, Basin uh, today, of course, is a large organization. Uh, it has uh, substantial generation, provides uh, electric power to, to people in uh, eight uh, or so states around the area. And uh, so I feel good about that. The, uh, uh, another organization that I had... Uh, a lot to do with was the North Central Data Cooperative, and that's headquartered in Mandan, North Dakota. What do they do? Pardon? What do they do? Uh, they do uh, electronic data processing for electric and now telephone cooperatives. Okay. And uh, they've been doing that uh, really for both since the the beginning. This was actually started by the North Dakota statewide and the original uh, interim or acting manager of, of uh, the organization was a uh, office person, uh, office manager for Basin Electric. Uh, this was in about 19, I think it was 1966 or 7, thereabouts. Anyway, uh, things didn't go too well to start with and the administrator of REA at that time appointed nine people from around the nation or around the area that Basin served to uh, go in and evaluate what was going on. And uh, uh, so we did that, and I was one of the nine. Uh, the reason REA got involved was that the electric cooperatives had put money into this thing, and uh, things were not going well. And, of course, REA was uh, concerned about the financial uh, aspects of it as far as the their borrowers were concerned. Anyway, out of that 
we incorporated a new organization called the North Central Data Cooperative. And that was the first regional data processing cooperative in the United States. So we, uh, we pioneered that, and uh, NCDC became a great success and still there today and providing a lot of valuable data processing services for electric and telephone co-ops. Um, and they operate in the basin area, but they also, I think, have expanded and are in a number of other states uh, in addition to that. Now, there's one other organization. Uh, should I talk about that one? Sure. That would be the Cooperative Response Center yes, in Minnesota. Uh, this right? is something that we did in Minnesota. Uh, a bunch of managers got together and and uh, were discussing what we could do to answer after-hour calls. You know, we used to do this by putting people on call over the weekend and you know, members that have to have their phone numbers, and, and that changed all the time, and it was just a kind of an unwieldy thing. Some had answering machines, and uh, none of that worked well. Anyway, we, uh, seven of us uh, managers, incorporated uh, an organization in 1992 at Austin, Minnesota, called the Cooperative Response Center. And... Our original idea there was that we would answer after-hour calls for uh, outages and that type of thing. Uh, the other thing that it would be a medical uh, alert answering system where people could put a special phone in their house and they could wear a pendant and push a button. And uh, the microphone on this phone was super sensitive and... Um, they fell down someplace in the house uh, and couldn't get to the phone. All they had to do was push that button, and it would call the center, and they could actually uh, call them from wherever they were or talk to them from wherever they were in the house. And one of the great benefits of that was it allowed elderly people to stay in their home longer, uh, especially when they were, were living alone. Mm -hmm. The uh, outage part of it uh, worked extremely well. And uh, we started this thing. Of course, the cooperatives that were interested in this put money in, and that's how we funded it. And today, uh, they're still there. The last I heard, they were providing service to about one and a half million customers, not only in Minnesota, but all of the United States and even out beyond the eastern seaboard. And uh, it was... Uh, this was exciting to me, in a way, because being one of the original incorporators, and uh, originally I was, uh, well, when I when I resigned uh, or retired, I was president of CRC, and uh, it was one of the really satisfying things in, in my tenure, being able to be a part of that. And so uh, between those three organizations, they... Uh, they provide a wealth of service to uh, actually uh, millions of people, so mm -hmm. it was uh, it was good. You might have actually saved some lives dealing with the senior citizens situation. Uh, I'm sure we have, yeah, without a doubt. This this phone uh, is just a, a miraculous piece of equipment. I. I demonstrated this at an annual meeting in Montevideo with about 800 people, and the phone was set up in the back of the room, and I'm up in front at the podium, and I'm talking over all these people who I had asked to be very quiet, and they were, but I pushed my pendant. It called the center at Austin, and, and we had this thing on a... Uh, he, they could, I could hear him, and he could hear me, even though I was probably a hundred and... 25 or so feet away from the microphone. Which is probably further away than any person would be in a home or home setting of that age, anyhow. That's true. And even if you were outside and fell down mm -hmm. uh, up to, a, a, you know, some limitations, of course, on distance, but if you were anywhere near the house, uh, you could still, it would still transcribe that conversation for you. Well, in the instance where a senior citizen might slip on the ice outside and be in danger of freezing to death. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was. It turned out to be a really valuable service, and uh, the the cooperatives who were involved in this, including Minnesota, we put a lot of other information on there. Like we sold uh, 
water heaters. If people wanted to find out what the price of a water heater was, they called the co-op and the people in Austin would answer, and they had all the information we, which we had to feed to them, of course. And uh, they could get what they're, you know, find out what they wanted to know. Uh, if there was outages, uh, they, was, they could always talk to a person. Mm-hmm. And that was, I always felt that was important, you know, to call up and talk to an answering machine when you're desperate for, for whatever reason, out of power or health problems or whatever. It's nice to be able to talk to somebody. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And we also, that, uh, there also was an affiliation with the local hospitals on this thing. So mm-hmm. it was a network that really, uh, that really provided a valuable medical service besides the outage thing. Sure. You also uh, served for a while as a, an interim manager after you retired, or were available to do that? I did. I made myself available, and I I did do that at Ipswich uh, Fem Electric Cooperative in uh, west of Aberdeen in 1999. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, I'd have probably been there longer, but I had a knee operation, and and it kind of limited my uh, my mobility and getting back and forth and so on, but. Uh, Yes, I did. I did do that. Okay. And uh, you have, I understand, you have some grandchildren. Oh, yeah. Two here in Rapid City. Uh, Bradley, that I uh, mentioned earlier, is uh, 15 years old. He's a freshman in high school. Which school does he go to? What school? Yeah. He goes to Stevens High School. Okay. And... uh, Bradley's interested in just about everything. He loves that farm, and he uh, knows how to run all the equipment, whatever it is. If it's a new machine, why, he's uh, he's got it figured out. He knows how to do it. And we're uh, I'm uh, anxious to watch him grow up and see what happens. He's he's an ambitious young man, and and it's pretty exciting to to be around that mm-hmm. chance to. Have a chance to uh, enjoy it, mm-hmm. and then uh, Kelsey, uh, uh, granddaughter, is uh, Bradley's uh, sister. She's 18, senior in high school, and Kelsey's kind of a world traveler. She's <clears throat> uh, made trips the last two summers. Go one year, first year went to Japan with a group, and. Uh, this last year now she went to Europe, uh, Switzerland and Austria and France and <clears throat> Italy and she seems to be pretty interested in this international thing and mm-hmm. I don't know what'll happen, but my guess is it's this might be something uh, she'll she'll pursue in her continuing education. She's a a uh, classy young lady and we're excited about seeing her grow up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, there are a lot of job opportunities for people who are interested in that, that kind of uh, travel. Oh, there sure is. Yep. Uh, anything else you would like to add? Well, I think that uh, pretty well covers it. There's, uh, you know, there's still a lot of stories I could tell about things that happened, but uh, those these things get... It's easier to get carried away, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I thank you for uh, reminding us to, and adding the, this ad, little additional information to, to the record, which is important, I think. Sure. Uh, well, that's uh, glad to do it, and uh, we'll be looking forward to, I understand there'll be a transcript down the road here? Yes. Okay. And at that point, I can kind of clean up the, clean up the language a little. Uh, That's right. I'd, this would not have been a good uh, Toastmasters production, you know. There's, They all count all the ahs. <laughs> do That's they? not okay. a good deal. Uh, it's easy to do that in these casual kind of settings. Uh-huh. Well, oh. you know, they, they probably would count the... Uh, I, I know there are some people who will say um, and 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 some people who will say um,